Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this evening's NAC at Home program. My name is Mitch Case and I'm with the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public. This includes exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings, and more. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you're interested in becoming a member of the NAC or would like more information, please email admissions at the nationalartsclub.org. I'm now going to share a message from Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, Chair of the Club's Archaeology Committee. Thank you, Mitch, and good evening, everyone. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, Chair of the Archaeology Committee of the National Arts Club, and delighted to welcome tonight's audience to a fascinating program entitled Digital Technology and the Recreation of Past Reality in Ancient Egypt, presented in collaboration with the American Research Center in Egypt's New York chapter. This is the Archaeology Committee's second online lecture devoted to virtual heritage, that innovative application of computer visual knowledge to create full understandings of archaeological objects and sites. An exciting recent approach within archaeology, it relates to the creation of complex three-dimensional digital models, which suggest novel possibilities for scholarship and teaching, such as the virtual restoration of damaged artifacts, or the depiction of virtual environments so that material culture can be better understood in its original context. I've requested that Mitch include under chat a link to Donald Sanders' August 10th, 2020 exploration of an analogous topic. Why so many realities? How virtual reality augments reality and mixed reality helps archeologists to relive the past. It is now my pleasure to introduce Stephen Michael Vinson, Professor and Chair, Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures, Indiana University, Bloomington. Professor Vinson received his MA in Nautical Archaeology from Texas A&M University and his PhD in Egyptology from Johns Hopkins University, where he was the first doctoral candidate of Betsy Bryan, who many of you heard this past June splendidly discuss Hatshepsut and the Temple of Mutt. Daxa Vinson is the author of Egyptian Boats and Ships, The Nile Boatmen at Work, The Craft of the Good Scribe, and the forthcoming Demotic Graffiti in the Valley of the Kings. A renowned lecturer and holder of a Fulbright Fellowship, Stephen has lectured at numerous symposia and globally organize a program for an international audience on ancient Egypt, new technology in March of 2019, before the COVID devastation, similar to plagues that were in antiquity. He currently researches digital understanding of Egyptian demotic motifs in the Valley of the King. And today we'll be comparing some recreations with objects from the Michael C. Collis Museum, the Sydney and Lois Eskenazi Museum, Thought, and the Brooklyn Museum to help us better understand what we see. Steve, if you will. All right, well, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight's lecture. And I'd especially like to thank you, Michelle, for the invitation to address all of you here tonight. Um, it's really a great honor. And before I Going further, let me just make sure I'm sharing the screen. So let me, let me begin by giving you a brief roadmap of what I'd like to talk about this evening. First, I'm going to talk just a little bit about my own background and how I happen to become interested in, uh, in this topic. I'll talk briefly about the early history of some digital projects in Egyptology, um, some of the early projects and platforms. I'll give some highlights of our own work at Indiana University um, on, on objects at the Brooklyn Museum and at the Michael C. Carlos Museum at Emory University in Atlanta, and the way in which we've used those results to try to go beyond just simple digital imaging. 
Then I'll give a brief shout out to some other important digital projects in Egyptology, some of which many of you are probably already familiar with. And finally, I'll offer a few thoughts on where I think all of this should go um, in the near and in the medium term. First, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a traditionally trained Egyptologist who's always worked primarily with texts. Until the last few years, my interest was really in Egyptian literature of the Greco-Roman period. I'm neither, an, I'm neither an artist, although we're here at the National Arts Club, nor am I personally really more than passingly proficient in advanced digital methodology. Mainly, I would say that I'm an advocate for the field and that I'm particularly keen to introduce students to the possibilities of applying virtual heritage methodology to the study of ancient Egypt. By virtual heritage, as Michelle has already mentioned, I mean using and applying digital visual visualization to scholarship, pedagogy, and public outreach. And by advanced digital visualization, I mean primarily, but not exclusively, three-dimensional modeling and virtual reality environments. So my involvement in this field really began about eight years ago and quite by accident. In August of 2013, I was attending the Indiana University new faculty picnic with a new hire we just made in our own department. And quite by uh, happenstance, I happened to sit at the same table as one Bernie Frischer, who had just been hired at Indiana University from the University of Virginia. Bernie may be known to many of you. He's a classical archeologist by training, who is one of the pioneers of virtual heritage. And he had just brought his virtual world heritage lab from uh, University of Virginia to IU. Now, one year before this, in 2012, I had just admitted um, an MA student in Egyptology to IU for the very first time, uh, Ling Shen Zhang, who many of you may know, who's just joined the faculty at Yale. Now, I'm a one-man Egyptology program, and I was in need of some additional classes for Ling Shen to take in her second year. And so I was really fascinated by Bernie's description of what he does, and I immediately um, advised Ling Shen to take the first iteration of Bernie's introduction to virtual heritage. She quite liked the class and wound up writing her MA thesis on a topic that Bernie proposed, doing a digital reconstruction of the Antino Antinoeon, uh, that is to say the uh, little chapel to Antinoeus at the villa of the Emperor Hadrian at Tivoli. Ling Shen went on to receive PhD acceptances from John Hopkins and Brown, and I realized immediately that the skills that Bernie could teach my students, along with the linguistic training that I was giving them, made them a very attractive package for Egyptology admission committees. Since then, I've recommended that all my MA students uh, that they take one or more courses in virtual heritage. Um, most of them have done so and with great, accept, great success. Not all of our alums have gone on to concentrate on digital applications in Egyptology, but we do now have, but we do now have three of our MA graduates doing their PhD at Harvard, where they're working with Peter Manuelian on the Digital Giza Project. And we have uh, three more at UCLA, where they are working on digital Egyptology projects with uh, Professor Willika Windrich and with the Kotzen Institute of Archaeology at UCLA, which has a, a digital archaeology lab. Now, Bertie has some great projects. Many of you are probably familiar with his Rome Reborn uh, platform. Um, or with his digital sculpture project, and especially his di digitization of classical statues at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Now, it was through this Uffizi project that I really became acquainted with the possibilities of digital modeling. If you haven't seen it, here's just a quick, a quick, uh, just a quick peek at so his platform. What you, uh, what you see popping up here are classical sculptures from, uh, from the Uffizi. And if you click on them, you will see a pop-up window from a 3D platform called Sketchfab. You can launch the 3D model. And by the way, I'll be doing this a lot with our own models. And you can see this, the Medici Venus, viewable from every angle. You can zoom in on her, see deep, details of her hair, her face, whatever you care to look at. So 
so it was this that really inspired me to uh, to to try to launch some digital um, a digital Egyptology project. But I was a latecomer to the field of digital applications in Egyptology, which, by the way, are not at all confined to visualization. Egyptian philology is really the field of Egyptology that was the first to explore digital platforms. Already back in the 1980s and 1990s, Egyptologists like Jan Johnson of the University of Chicago had begun using computer, computer graphics and test processing on major philological projects like for Chicago Demotic Dictionary. Now, this is the landing page um, of the project. Here's just a page from, um, from, one of the from one of the dictionary pages. I have to say, I only noticed after I had randomly selected this page that the entry for donkey dung um, is rather prominent here. My, my apologies for that. Egyptian philology has a, has a large number of philology of digital tools. Um, nearly everyone who works on Egyptian texts now uses this tool, the Thesaurus Lingua Egyptiae, which has a large corpus of digitized Egyptian texts and an online dictionary. Um, here's the interface. It's a bit clumsy to navigate. Um, and it's not beautifully designed, but what you get when you finally find what you're looking for is a page like this, which gives you a transliteration of the Egyptian on the left, a, uh, a German translation on the right. What's, a, what's very useful is that the transliteration is entirely clickable, so every word will take you to an online dictionary. As I say, it's, it's a bit clumsy to navigate. I don't believe it's being actively worked on, uh, but it's still a great tool, and I and my students and I'm sure everyone in Egyptology uses this constantly. Now there's a new, a new philology, a phil, excuse me, a new philology tool that's um, only a, a few years old, the Demotic Paleographical Database Project from, from Heidelberg, which has, not now, which has some interesting features, including a, um, an artificial intelligence tool that allows you to attempt to find demotic signs by drawing them. So you can draw in this little interface here, and then you will get um, a number of suggestions for the sign that you just drew, and this one actually came out correct. Sometimes um, it's a bit random, but this was a nice, this was a nice demonstration of that. But for archeology span and for objects, um, another common use of digital technology since the 1990s has been to try to create sites that will aggregate large amounts of Egyptological material, including images. Um, one of the earliest major attempts at this was a Dutch project, the Global Egyptian Museum, which is still up on the web, although it's, it's uh, in abeyance. It's primarily a source of small two-dimensional images uh, with the kind of information that would be typical for a museum catalog. So as I say, you can still use it. You can... You can search for a material, let's say granite, and you will get links to the objects that are in their database. But the, but the photos are typically small, not high resolution. Um, you don't get a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of views. So while this is a, an interesting and a useful tool still uh, with a lot, of, a lot of material on it, it's really not quite what we would really like to see in a repository of Egyptian material. Now I need to get rid of this. There we go. Another early project in digital visualization, which again, some of you may be familiar with, is the digital Karnak uh, platform um, that was created at, at UCLA. This project is also in abeyance, but the, uh, the, the, the website um, is archived and parts of it can still be accessed. The digital renderings of Karnak that are in this uh, project are, are no longer exactly cutting edge, but there's still a lot of useful information on this site, and I use it quite often. There are there are videos on, on temple rituals, 
of the development of the site, um, et cetera. But of course, the most important and extensive visualization project in Egyptology right now uh, is Peter Manuelian's Digital Giza project at, at Harvard, which is still under construction and is becoming really more uh, impressive and useful um, by the day. I'll return to this briefly at the end of my remarks. But first, I would like to talk about our own project at uh, Indiana University, which is at an early stage. For five years now, uh, we've been working on photogrammetry and modeling of objects in the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and now with the Michael C. Carlos Museum at Emory University in Atlanta. And uh, here I should thank Indiana University for generous internal funding uh, for this project, for great cooperation, really great from both the Brooklyn and the Carlos, and most especially from the help extended by Katia Barbash um, at the Brooklyn and by Melinda Hartwig at the Carlos and, uh, and their entire teams. I can't really name all the students who've worked on the project over the years, but I would like to mention two, Aaron Anderson, who's now a PhD student at Harvard, and Amanda Ladd, who's now a PhD student at the University of Toronto. In our last two campaigns at Brooklyn and at Atlanta, um, they both did phenomenal work as organizers, data managers, and, and frankly, den mothers, keeping me and the rest of the students moving in the right direction. I'm also very happy to acknowledge Professor Gabriele Guidi, who's currently a professor at the Politecnico di Milano, uh, but will soon join Indiana University's, Indiana University's faculty. Um, I need to thank him for indispensable advice and assistance in developing our photogrammetry technique. And I must also thank uh, Mr. Muhammad Abdelaziz, who is currently a PhD student uh, at Alexandria University. He worked at Indiana University for a year with me as a research associate, and he has processed most of, almost all of the models that I'll show in the next few moments. Muhammad has also worked for the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities and for the French underwater excavations at Alexandria. And uh, he now works uh, for Bernie Frischer on the Rome Reborn platform. Um, he is amazingly proficient at this. I like to refer to him really as the, the Tentoretto of Egyptian virtual heritage. Um, you all, I think, will see what I, what I mean. Now, currently, the models that we have created are hosted on Sketchfab, which is the most widely used host for 3D content. This is the landing page for, for our collection. You see IU Egypt here. Um, at this stage of what we're doing, we are concentrating on photogrammetry and modeling. But in the long run, we'd like to build a dedicated portal for 3D Egyptological content, um, which would include some tools and features not currently available on Sketchfab or on the other 3D visualization platform that's used for cultural heritage projects on a, large, on a wide basis, 3D Hop. Ultimately, the hope is not to just present visually appealing digital artifacts, but to create a platform that will enable actually work to be done. And I'll come back to some of my ideas in the conclusion. Now, for those who are not familiar with the procedure, let me briefly describe in a very simple way, uh, in very brief way, the process of creating a digital model using photogrammetry. That is not using a scanning device, but with a series of photographs. Photogrammetry takes longer than scanning, and for some times of objects may not work as well as laser or other kinds of structured light scanners, but it's less expensive and it produces better visual results. Um, for example, a high-end digital 35 millimeter camera like the Sony Alpha 7R or the Nikon D850s that we use will cost around four to $5,000, including the body and a selection of quality lenses which sounds expensive, but you can buy four or more such camera setups for the cost of a laser scanner. Well, we start, um, as you see here in this photograph, um, by setting up targets, which provide fixed points that we can physically measure. Those measurements are inputted into the modeling program Metashape, which then embeds digital uh, dimensional information in the 3D model file. The next step is to photograph the object in a series of overlapping shots from every accessible angle. Either the camera moves around the object or the object itself can be physically turned if that's possible. Photos are taken in raw format, meaning the image files are uncompressed and contain all of the information that was recorded by the camera's light sensor with minimal processing. It's particularly important to get a sufficient number of overlapping shots on the top of an object, and particularly of the sculpture of a human figure, 
Otherwise, and this happened to us quite often in our first attempts, you get an effect that one of my students dubbed the shotgun head, which means that the head of the model has a large jagged hole in it. Photos are imported into a program called Adobe Lightroom where they can be adjusted to make sure that the white balance is correct so that color rendering will be true and to make sure that the photos have as uniform exposure as possible. Photos are then exported as compressed JPEG files since the modeling software that we use, Metashape, cannot process raw files. The raw files are kept separately, of course, so that the images can be reprocessed um, if necessary. The photos are then uh, loaded into Metashape, which analyzes them at the pixel level, attempting to find and match up the overlapping areas of each photo. As you can see from this screenshot, if you look right here, you'll see that we took 173 uh, photos of this object. It's a granite seating uh, scribal statue of which 170 were able to be matched up, which is pretty good. Um, the three non-aligned photos were probably shots of the object label that we used to begin and end the series. So that we look, so when we look at, at photos on our camera's memory cards, we can easily sort them out. In this main viewing panel, uh, you can see a nearly completed model. It's, we're looking at it from the top down. The blue rectangles hovering around it are the positions of the camera for each photograph that we took. The final step is to apply a texture. That is, it's a, a, a graphics file, JPEG file, uh, that so to speak wraps around the 3D model to give it a photorealistic appearance. And then to post that model to a viewing platform, in our case, Sketchfab. Now, one can just let Metashape create and apply the model's texture, um, but there's quite a bit of manual work that can be done at this stage to improve the appearance of the texture using a variety of additional software tools, um, which I won't go into here. Um, however, as we'll see a bit later, we may not always want to view the object exactly as it appears in nature, because sometimes a photorealistic texture actually obscures information. So we currently have three collections up on Sketchfab. Um, our largest collection is, are the objects from the Brooklyn Museum. We've done a few models at the Eskenazi Museum here at Indiana University. But that collection has been inaccessible over the last few years due to a major renovation and reinstallation of the collection. So we haven't done that much work there. Um, this past summer, we also did photogrammetry on about 50 objects at the Carlos Museum at Emory, of which we've got um, pretty good preliminary renderings of five objects. So what I'd like to do now is to go through some highlights of our collection and talk about the challenges and the results of different kinds of objects. The first one I'd like to, to show you is this granite lion from the Brooklyn Museum. This is a model that's uh, said to belong to the late pre-dynastic or early dynastic period. So somewhere between 3,300 and 3,000 BC. It's, when one looks at it, probably one immediately thinks that it's granite, but I looked it up and I saw that it's actually carved from pegmatite, which according to Wikipedia is chemically identical to granite, but has a somewhat rougher texture. Um, rough stone like this, I would say makes a really great, uh, really great model. It's not over reflective in the, uh, the texture makes it easy for the camera to focus. We get nice details here of the nose, the mouth, and the eyes. The next object I'd like to show you is this family triad of Nika Ra and his family. This is Brooklyn 49.215. It's a very nice polychrome Old Kingdoms object. For me, what makes Egyptian sculpture really interesting for this kind of work, more interesting really than the kinds of classical sculptures that Bernie works on is the polychrome.
it makes a much more visible, uh, makes a much more attractive impression. And likewise, the hieroglyphic inscriptions that are on most of these objects are extremely interesting to model. And the technique, oops, going the wrong way here, gives good results. And, you know, frankly, in, in all honesty, I really love damage statues. And because it's the damage, it's, where, it's where, where you have damage that you can really see the detail um, and the sharpness of the, of the model. Now, as many of you all will know, uh, the Brooklyn Museum has a number of statues of this uh, individual, Machechi. These statues come from Saqqara, uh, late fifth or early sixth dynasty. And this is a wooden statue. And I would, would love to say, I will say that wooden statues, really the polychrome wooden statues, especially make beautiful, beautiful models because the polychrome survives quite well. The details turn up. And again, I told you I love damage because it's really, it's when the, when the model is damaged that you can really focus in on sharp details. We have beautiful results here of the pot with, from the polychromy, his collar, the coloration of his kilt, and the details of the wig, which are really nice. No shotgun head here. Now, the staff may not seem like the most interesting um, aspect of this, of this statue, but this was actually a, quite a challenge for us. Um, the first time we took it, we just didn't get enough photos of the staff itself. And so we didn't get enough information to actually render it. We had to go back and re-photograph it. Uh, otherwise, we just had large, large gaps here where the staff um, is supposed to be in Machechi's hand. Now, this head of a female sphinx is one of my really true favorite objects in the Brooklyn collection. This is from chlorite. It's dated to the Middle Kingdom. The principal challenge of modeling this was the fact that it's quite reflective, okay? Um, we tried a polarizing filter, but even that didn't really kill um, the reflection. So what we wound up doing to photograph it was to build a kind of a tent around it with collapsible backgrounds um, to try to uh, block the light coming from windows and from overhead lights um, in the gallery. Um, I was actually quite amazed um, that the photos we took turned out to be useful and to produce these kinds of results, but uh, Muhammad did a remarkable job. This object also has an interesting history. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, the Brooklyn be believes it would have been produced in Lower Egypt around uh, Heliopolis, but its modern history began or begins or began when it was acquired in the 18th century by a famous Italian antiquarian and, and cardinal, um, Alessandro Albini. It's speculated by the Brooklyn that the object may have been brought to Italy um, originally on behalf of the Emperor Hadrian and that it may have been displayed by Hadrian um, at the Imperial Villa at uh, Tivoli. The object apparently had inlaid eyes, um, which were pried out in antiquity. And you can see that there have been repairs done here as well. The Brooklyn says that at least some of the repairs, probably here of the chin and around the lips, that some of the repairs may have been done in the 18th century as well. This next object, the pair statue of Nebsen and Nebeta, is one of the real, the real treasures of the Brooklyn Egyptian collection. 
This is Brooklyn 40.253. It's a mid 18th dynasty uh, statue. Beautifully intact with amazing details in the, the wigs of both the male and the female figure, which came out very nicely. The back panel has these beautiful blue painted hieroglyphs of which the details actually came out amazingly in our model. The polychromy of the, of the jewelry or the collars, the collar of the female figure, the armband, really, really amazing. Now, it's a bit of a challenge to do an object like this because it's important that you photograph from every possible angle, which means to photograph so that you get the bottom of the wigs, up under the arms, um, under the chin, and under the ears. Otherwise, you wind up with, with gaps in the model. This is a nice example of a New Kingdom granite statue without polychromy on it, but very attractive nonetheless. This is of a priest from Karnak named, named Kamwaz, kneeling with an emblem of Hathor. For those who know a bit about Egyptology, you're familiar with the name Kamwaz. There was a famous son of Ramses II by that name, but this is not a statue of that, of that in, individual. This is uh, rather a person who lived during the reign of Tutmosis IV, circa 1400 to 390 BC. There's actually a cartouche of Tutmosis IV's throne name um, on the figure's right shoulder, um, Menkep Array. The challenge here um, for this object is the somewhat low contrast and worn um, state of the hieroglyphic inscriptions. This would actually benefit from an augmented reality presentation, which uh, I'll talk a little bit about, talk about a little bit later. But the glyphs on the back panel are actually quite nice. This is another wooden statue. In this case, without very much polychromy left on it. This is Sa Iset the Younger from the 19th dynasty, Brooklyn 47.120.2. Obviously much less well-preserved than the statues of Machechi, um, but the surface details are really beautiful. The, um, the Ramesid um, uh, pleats on the garment are nevertheless beautiful. Without the polychromy on it, you can really see the wood grain which is quite nice. The eyes, unfortunately, were and the eyebrows would have been inlaid. Those are gone. There's a few hieroglyphs here on the front, which can be seen, but there's a bit of polychromy. So I can turn this thing around. Preserved on the back, where these glyphs actually come out came out quite nice. It's uh. Just a Hetep Dimisu formula, an offering formula. But we have good results here. We can really push in on this and see the, see the glyphs quite up close and personal. Oops, I went to just a bit too far here. This is a 25th dynasty stila of a woman named Tahenemet, um, dead and in the presence of Raharakti. Now, this is obviously a two dimensional object and it's mounted on a wall and it's within a vitrine you can't view the object in the round, um, but this is nevertheless a great demonstration of why um, 3D modeling can, is so useful, 
even for an object, again, that you can't really see in the round. Um, if you push in, we can see a really high level of detail here. We can pan, we can zoom. Really go all the way in and see every detail here. The colors of the falcon's face are just beautiful. And the hieroglyphs here are so nice. It's really better um, than a paper publication um, at any, in any format and um, at any price. The next object, it's a nice, Ptolemaic royal head. This one was a, a challenge to uh, to photograph because it's displayed in a vitrine and it, which it, which produces annoying reflections on glass surfaces that are that are in the photographs. We tried to to shoot it once in the vitrine and got completely unsatisfactory results. Um, we came back the following year and were able to get the vitrine removed, and that's when we shot most of the photos that went into this model. But even then, our initial rendering produced a model with, uh, with the shotgun head. So we had to go back and take additional shots uh, from within the vitrine um, to get the rest of, rest, rest of the head. Uh, but the results are actually quite good um, with sharp details around the eyes, the lips, the ears, and again, the damage. A nice kind of archaic smile on the king's face. Now, those of you who've been in see, to see the Brooklyn um, Egyptian collection, if you've gone all the way to the back of the gallery, you've undoubtedly seen this object, which is actually quite spectacular. This is a canopic chest. which is to say it's a chest that um, contained canopic jars, the jars that were used or would have been used uh, to contain the internal organs of a deceased person. Again, this is a wooden object with really amazing painting on it. And I think everyone loves the falcon on top and uh, the gold leaf on the bird looks quite nice. Beautifully preserved with wonderful details. Now, I suspect that everyone's guilty favorite Brooklyn object is this one, Brooklyn 58.13, um, to which the Brooklyn gives the, uh, the anodyne name erotic composition. But I think almost everyone knows it as, for obvious reasons as Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Um, it's a Ptolemaic uh, date, and it's one of the most elaborate of such compositions. Um, there are others, they're, they're actually quite common. Brooklyn has several of them, but none, none others that are quite this elaborate. Um, it's painted limestone, not really reflective, so it photographs really well. Uh, but the challenge of this object is its complex geometry. Um, now, I would like to show you our model, but it was just our luck today that someone at Sketchfab discovered this model um, and has uh, disabled it, as you can see. I don't know if it was a person or if it was their AI that found it, uh, but they apparently um, find it too pornographic uh, to be uh, to be publicly available. So I will try to sort that out um, in the near future. But I think you get the idea, right? The, uh, the real challenge is to make sure that you photograph below and between and through all the body parts. Um, what's also, well, I, I would 
since I can't show you the model, I can't uh, show you the point that I would like to make, but the female figure, although most of the polychromy on the body is gone, there's still a bit left. And there's polychromy that's visible on her wig um, and some on the body. And so I think that it would be possible to analyze this and to digitally restore it um, in ways which I will describe a little bit later. Okay. This Roman, uh, Roman period mummy mask, Brooklyn 72.57, is particularly beautiful. And the, the folds, uh, the indentations and the gold leaf surface photographed extremely well. Um, makes a beautiful model, even though this was actually shot from within a vitrine. Um, but the details on the headdress, the face, the eyes, the molded gold um, inlays, really quite spectacular. Again, we can't really view this entirely in the round. It's, it's mounted on... Um, this little this little stand, so we can't see the inside of it. But the eyes, the eyes really grab you. Now I'd like to uh, to highlight a few objects that we've completed from our Emory campaign this this past summer. This is a Middle Kingdom solar boat model, Carlos Museum 2018.010.415. This is actually a pastiche model. And by that, I mean that it's, it doesn't, it's not really, we're not really looking at any model that ever existed in antiquity. Um, this was probably put together in the late 19th or early 20th century by an antiquities dealer who had parts of several boats and crews, um, none of them complete, and so put everything together to, uh, to make a complete object uh, for sale. It's actually the object right now of a very interesting analysis by a visiting fellow at the Carlos Museum who has um, done some uh, CT scanning of the object itself, uh, which has revealed a number of very interesting things about its construction including holes for the insertion of, of the crew members um, that were clearly drilled at a later date with other holes for uh, the insertion of deck structures or perhaps different, different figures, which were covered over and filled in. Um, apparently it's part of the process of creating um, the boat model as we actually have it right now. Nevertheless, it's a beautiful object. We photographed it very thoroughly. One thing we learned from the Machechi uh, photogrammetry was to make sure that we got enough photos of the pole mast. And so that was not an issue. The figures look good. We have these shrines at the end with a hawk on it. I am not really an art historian or, or an expert in funerary culture, but this shrine, and perhaps somebody can make a remark on this later in the chat uh, or discussion, looks a lot, reminds me of the, of the Canopic Shrine with, you know, it's obviously a shrine with a hawk on top. I don't know if that's a, intended to be some sort of a similar function. The polychromy came out very nice. The wood grain as well underneath underneath the, uh, the gesso covering. Um, now, the challenge of an object like this is obviously it's complex geometry. It's not as complex as the Brooklyn erotic composition, but it's still important to get data from below and between arms and legs, under chins, et cetera. Another project, another problem with a, uh, with a, a long object like this is depth of field, um, especially when focusing along the axis of the boat, you can't get the whole object in focus in a single shot. Um, but nevertheless, I think we got reasonable results.
if you've been to the Carlos Museum, to their Egyptian collection, you've seen this object and a number of others like it. They've got some very attractive late period coffins on display in the gallery and some others in storage, which we also did, but this was just one. I, I find the coffin particularly nice. And so I asked uh, Muhammad to model this for us uh, as I was preparing for this discussion. Um, I think our results are pretty good, um, but they're not as good as they could have been for reasons for which I'm really at fault. Um, large features like the face and the eyes look pretty good. I mean, you can push on this and everything seems to be quite sharp and the feathers on the headdress are, are sharp as well. But when you push in on the hieroglyphs, as you get close, they start to get a little bit fuzzy and a little bit pixelated. And I think the reason for this is the following. This object, as I said, is in a vitrine, meaning that glass case, we couldn't get as close to it as we would have liked to. And especially we couldn't get really close to the, to the very top. Um, we, fo we, uh, we photographed it with one of our Nikon D850s with a 35 millimeter lens. Um, but I think that because we couldn't get as close as we really wanted to to it, uh, we would have been better off using a 50 or 60 millimeter lens, which um, I hope we have a chance to redo this at uh, a subsequent, subsequent visit. Here's a nice mummy mask, Ptolemaic. Not as elaborate as the, um, the Roman mask that I showed you all a few moments ago. But similar in some ways, including the fact that the face is covered over in gold leaf. This made it a bit tricky to, uh, to photograph because again, we couldn't use a polarizing filter to kill, kill the reflections. Um, but we learned a little trick, um, which I'm sure that, that any professional photographer out there knows, knows very well, um, from a tip from the, the Carlos uh, curator who was sort of minding us while we worked in the storeroom, which is where this object is. Uh, this gentleman has seen many professional photographers doing object shoots. And so what he suggested was that we uh, put a diffuser over over the, over the object uh, to, you know, to uh, smoothen out the lights from uh, the lights from the overhead lights, which actually worked pretty well, except the only problem was that our diffuser was actually quite small. It was just a little piece of, of uh, translucent cloth that goes over the openings of the light box in our studio light kit, which was actually fine because this is a small, small object. Uh, but on coming home, I, I, uh, I checked that I learned and that you can buy large collapsible diffusers that work just like our collapsible background. So I will definitely have uh, a few of those on hand for our next uh, project. Now this object was, uh, was photographed with our Sony Alpha 7R, which has 50% more resolution than the Nikon D850s, about 60 megapixels uh, to the um, Nikon's 40 something. Another example, another advantage of the Sony is that Sony permits third-party manufacturers to produce autofocus lenses for their camp for their bodies, which Nikon doesn't, um, including Zeiss. So we have uh, Zeiss lenses for this camera. Um, so the details, you can really push in on the eyes and the eyebrows here, really sharp. And the final object that I'd like to show you from the Carlos collection is this. This is a small sarcophagus um, for a falcon mummy. A polychrome wooden object um, showing a man in the presence of a, of a falcon, which is what you would expect, falcon divinities, all the rest of it. This was, also this was also photographed with the Sony Alpha 7R and uh, a Zeiss 18 millimeter lens. So the details are really quite amazing. Um, this was not reflective. It was easy to get up close to it. So it was not particularly challenging uh, photographically. Um, 
But if, but what's per, what's interesting, at least to me, is that the fact that it has a demotic inscription, demotic inscription on top. Now it's not particularly interesting. All it says is in regnal year six, first month of summer, which I take to mean uh, when this falcon was was buried. Okay, but what's somewhat interesting about it is the fact that the Carlos Museum has dated this object to the 26th dynasty, so the the Sayite period. Um, but my impression of the Demotic here is that it's um, Roman period Demotic, and so I would respectfully. Um, suggest to the Carlos that they may want to consider um, redating this object. Okay, so the question is, so what? Um, these are beautiful objects, beautiful renderings, um, but what's the actual point of doing all of this besides just creating um, attractive objects that we can view um, online? The first, uh, the first uh, answer to this is, as I mentioned before, this is a really superior way to, uh, to publish images, uh, whether we're thinking in terms of, of online catalogs or more formal publications. I just wanna recall here, just to take a random example, uh, the Brooklyn Tahenemet Stila uh, and our model of it. If you compare this to the photo that's included in the Brooklyn online catalog, which is down here, um, you can see the difference. I, mean, I think over time, all museums are going to produce models like this and they will embed them in their online catalogs. Now, obviously that takes time and resources, um, but the cost of these things goes down constantly. 3D content can also be embedded in e-publications. Now, from what I've seen, 3D content in a PDF is kind of laggy, it's not very high resolution, but if the image is, is linked to a repository like Sketchfab or some other, some other platform where the models can be viewed online in high resolution, then this provides a completely superior way to view objects, um, potentially far more comprehensive in detail than even a series of high quality um, 2D images. The other advantage of digital versions of objects are the many new ways they offer to study them. Here are three renderings of a Middle Kingdom coffin in the Brooklyn of a Princess Mayat. On the left, you see the, the, texture, the texture map version. Let me load the model up here. The texture map version, which basically means it's how the model looks in the gallery. In the center is the model, which was done through the lab color filter in Adobe Photoshop. But what I really wanted to talk about is the one here on the right, which was processed through D-stretch. Now, you know, archaeologists out there and others will probably know that D-stretch is, is a graphics processing program that was developed for the use of people who study rock art. And it's especially good at bringing out um, traces of very faint pigment. And if you look at, the, look at the coffin from the top, you compare the inscription along the top of the, of the coffin as it as it appears if you just look at it, um, to the same inscription processed through D-stretch, you can see the advantage here, much more visible, much more legible, even though obviously D-stretch creates all kinds of annoying color artifacts, but it would be a great boon. Look at the clarity of the hieroglyphs over here. A great boon to anyone studying an object like this for the first time um, who needs a bit of help to try to, to identify faded uh, or obscured signs. Another little de-stretch project that we did is this. This is uh, an anthropoid coffin face uh, from the third intermediate period. You'll recognize this face from my title slide with the big eyes. But when D-stretch was applied to the object, we saw this little pencil inscription, um, which apparently is the autograph of one of the original collectors. Now, when you look at, at the, the object itself, the inscription is there, but it's not so obvious. Um, so 
So this made a little contribution to the modern history um, of our anthropoid coffin face. Now here we've already, we've already had a look at this at this sculpture. This is uh, the block statue of Brooklyn uh, three six six one seven. Um, if you've been to the Brooklyn Egyptian collection, you've undoubtedly walked past this. It's fairly prominently displayed. A granite model. Nice details of the face. The hands, the feet, etc. But nothing really spectacular about it. If, however, you compare, you view the uh, you know, the object with the, the granite texture disabled, you suddenly notice that it's got an inscription on it. Egyptologists out there, of which I hope there are many, will recognize Sinetur for incense, Hatia, Hetemu Biti, Samarwati, the, um, the mayor, the sealer of the, of the king of Upper Egypt, the, uh, up, excuse me, the seal bearer of Lower Egypt, um, the unique companion. Now, we can get in even closer. Another line down here. Now, if you're in the gallery and you look at the, at the actual object itself quite closely, you can, you can actually see uh, this inscription. Um, it's, it was no, it's not a new discovery on our part. The inscription's actually been published, but it's not obvious. You really don't see it unless you really get right up to it and, and move light around uh, to, to really try to bring out the details. Um, Muhammad, Muhammad uh, Abdelaziz, who educated me and my team on this trick, has applied this technique to, um, to a number of granite objects in Alexandria uh, with great success. Um, and he can, if we have a chance to talk, he can uh, talk about that um, as well. Now, another useful tool for recovering damaged or obscure detail is called reflectance transformation imagery or RTI. With RTI, a series of photographs is taken of an object from a single fixed point with a light source moving around and illuminating the object from different angles. Typically you would take 48 shots, one at each clock um, position. A program called RTI Builder uh, merges those photos into uh, a single file, which then you load into another program called the RTI Viewer, which allows you to simulate the movement of light across the surface of an object. Uh, much as an epigrapher in the field, would move an actual light around, hoping that as shadows fall in different places, hidden details um, would become apparent. Now, one of our ma master students, so I've already mentioned, I think, Erin Anderson, um, is working or is completing now her MA thesis on this object in the Eskenazi Museum. It is a Horus Kipus, that is to say, it's a little magical stela. Uh, with an image of Horace the Child on it, um, and with Horace the Child who's dominating various dangerous creatures, scorpions, lions, etc. cetera. Um, figure of Bess above the head, crocodiles here being stepped on, and an inscription on the back. And you'll notice that this object was purchased from a collector who apparently bought it who knows where, but wherever it was, there was a, a price tag on it, which has yet to be removed, unfortunately. Uh, the object is not on display, it's in storage. It is our profound hope that they will eventually have the, the price tag removed. But what you really notice about it, I think, is that the inscriptions on the front and back are actually quite worn and, and difficult to read. So even with a model, even pushing in on it, you don't see the details as, as well as you would like to. And this is a very good model. This is not the best object of its kind in the world. I mean, this is essentially, this is 
of the same type, although emphatically not of the same quality as uh, the Metternich stele and the Met, which I'm sure many of you many of you are familiar with. But what RTI allows you to do is to load the object into the RTI viewer, and I, you should be able to see this, I hope you can, um, where you see the object, and over here is a little virtual trackball which you can move around. And as you move it around, light moves across the object. You can illuminate it from, from any angle. And shadows will appear, and objects that aren't super visible will become more visible. I think if we really zoom in a little bit, a good place to, to look at, to notice that is right here. There's a falcon right here, which is actually quite washed, washed out when the light is hitting it from here, but becomes more visible as you move the light over here. Likewise, this seated divinity down here, quite visible from this angle, visible here, but washed out when the light's from here, hitting it from this angle. Anyone who's worked in Chicago house or done an epigraphic project has done this with mirrors or with handheld lights on the field, but not everybody can get to the field. And so creating an RTI file um, of an object allows anyone with a computer and the software, and by the way, the software is free, uh, a download from a, a, a nonprofit called uh, Cultural, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, um, Cultural Heritage Imaging, I think. Um, so yeah, any, anyone can use the software, anyone can get it and uh, make their own RTI images. Now, what this is particularly useful for and what Aaron has used it for is to aid in the production of a drawing of the object. So um, with RTI, the person who's doing the drawing can use it to illuminate details and make it possible to see things that otherwise are, are not visible. Okay. Going beyond that, it's possible to do a, a full digital restoration of an object, okay? Now, as I learned from Bernie Frischer, virtual heritage distinguishes between two main types of models. State models, which show objects as they currently exist as an archeological object or on display, and restoration models, which use digital tools to restore the objects. Um, all the models I've shown you so far from our project are state models. Digital restoration, on the other hand, is a way to non-destructively and inexpensively present ideas on how an object once looked at some previous stage of its existence and to go beyond that to create a, a context for it. Now, to give an idea of what's possible, I asked Muhammad to create this demonstration project. Online, I purchased two epoxy resin reproductions of the bust of Nefertiti. One was left intact and the other one was artificially aged. We knocked pieces off with a hammer, remove the polychromy with sandpaper. Muhammad then modeled the two statues, the intact statue for reference and the age statue for use as the basis of a digital restoration model. Um, starting with the age statue, Muhammad then produced the restoration model, which you see on the far left. And it looks pretty good. Now, to make it clear that this is indeed a digital restoration, you'll notice that some, some details were left quite a little bit unfinished. The, um, the wear of the polychromy on the band of the crown is the same here in the restoration model. The chunk over here is the same as the lost chunk over here. But polychromy has all been restored. The eye has been fixed up. The gouged out lips have been fixed up. The eyes, I don't know, the eye could maybe use a little bit of work, but um, there it is. This kind of technique can obviously be used on a real object uh, to create a digital rendering of what the object would have been 
how it would have appeared at some earlier stage of its existence. By the way, for those who may wonder, this was done with, an, with another uh, program called uh, ZBrush, which is a digital sculpture program. Very complicated, as you can see here from the user interface, uh, but very effective for this kind of work. Now, this technique has been used effectively by another of our former students, Mat uh, Matei Tichindelian, who's now a PhD student at UCLA, uh, for his MA thesis on the Akhenaten torso in the Brooklyn Museum, which many of you have seen, uh, Brooklyn 58.2. The object, uh, the, the Akhenaten torso, was found in a trench next to the Great Temple of the Aten at Amarna by Flinders Petrie in his 1891-1892 field season. Um, now, after looking at as many Amarna uh, royal sculptures as Matei could find, um, as well as Amarna reliefs that show the statues in, uh, or that show statues in situ in the Amarna in the Great Aten Temple, uh, Matei came to the conclusion that the original object was probably a standing figure holding an offering tray. And here's we can have a look at Matei's model. Again, not really intended as a final rendering, but a hypothesis as to what the object would have would have looked like. Matei then went on to try to recontextualize the object, looking at the archaeology of the temple of, temple to the Aten, and looking at Egyptian reliefs that show the object, um, show the Aten um, in use, he created this rendering using a architectural program called SketchUp. And it's, it's annotated and you can kind of go through a little tour of the object to see exactly what the basis of, of all of this is, right? So um, you can't really, well, if, I click, well, if I click on this, maybe I can go to it. This is a depiction of the Great Temple to the Aten that he used as a, uh, a basis for, for part of his restoration. Oops, let's get back to this. Following along, he found a bit of texture that he could apply to give an idea as to what the, uh, the facade of the temple would have looked like. But here's the meat of the, of the dissertation where he places the statue um, in various locations within the Temple of the Aten, based on talatat that show statues and where they're located um, in the Temple to the Aten. One possibility is here. Another possibility is out here. And again, he gives full annotation as to exactly why he thinks it's possible that the statues might have been um, in these locations. Okay, um, now before I conclude, I'd just like to give a shout out to some other interesting digital uh, Egyptology projects. Um, Rita Lucarelli at UC, at UC Berkeley has a repository of coffin models um, called Book of the Dead in 3D. Many of you all may find this very interesting. Here's a list of coffins that she has and you can click on them. And she actually has quite high quality models of these. As you can see, the glyphs are quite sharp, even if the, the polychromy on this particular example is a bit faded. Pervival is a, a project that my uh, colleague uh, Gabriele, Guidi, uh, Gabriele Guidi has been involved on, in in, uh, in Milan. Um, Pervival is, a, is an acronym whose full form I will not embarrass myself by trying to pronounce, but it's here on the slide. 
Um, in English, the project title is glossed as Virtual Pathways Among Art Collections. What Gabrielli and his, con his colleagues have done is used imaging to create comprehensive total presentation of objects in museums in Milan and their interconnections. Aside from photogrammetry and modeling, they've used CAT scanning, um, both on the sarcophagus. And it's really amazing actually to see a CAT scan of this object. You can see um, just how complex the construction of these things actually can be, as well as CAT scanning on the mummy itself. Um, so that what you have ultimately is a comprehensive integrated presentation of the mummy and its associated artifacts from the interior of the mummy all the way to the exterior of the outer coffin. And then of course there's uh, digital Giza. Now I was planning uh, when, I, when I was thinking about this lecture to show a bit of, of digital Giza, which is of course the premier Egyptological virtual heritage site, uh, but there's just really too much to explore in the time um, that I have left. So I just encourage everyone to have a look. Uh, the Harvard team continues to work on it. It's becoming more and more of, an, of a platform where you get not just uh, attractive images and cool technology, but ever more solid scholarly information, as well as popularly oriented uh, tours led by Peter himself, um, makes a really nice mix of popular outreach, outreach and uh, solid scholarship that scholars and students can use. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. Now, it's, of course, it's not the kind of thing that uh, everyone can start, but there are there is a Harvard project that I think is within the reach of most Egyptological practitioners, uh, which is the augmented rea uh, reality presentation of the Tutmosis IV Dream Stela, um, which allows, among other things, users to, to view a clarified version of the hieroglyphic inscription and possible models of the object's context between the paws of the Sphinx at various points in history. Um, this is a great tool, not only for visitors to the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East, which is the new name of what many of you know as the Harvard Semitic Museum, but also for Egyptology students who need to study the inscription of the stela. So for me, the key to making the most of this kind of technology is to go beyond the gee whiz impact of the technology and to make sure that we use it for the purposes that professional Egyptologists uh, get paid for, at least some of us get paid for it, uh, for scholarship, education, and outreach. Each of these constituencies has different needs and different expectations. And so the way we use the technology will differ depending on the audience we have in mind. Any given platform ought to be accessible and usable to all, intuitive and navigable enough so that people can find what they need and ignore the rest. For our own digital uh, project, our goal is to move beyond the simple presentation of our material on Sketchfab and to ultimately build a comprehensive portal where we can host our material, hopefully bring other partners on board. Now for this, we're going to need eventually to design new tools and features which are not available on Sketchfab and, we're not, and which are also not even available um, in the current um, iteration of 3D Hop, which is the other uh, pre uh, the other platform that's commonly used for for cultural heritage, among other places by the Smithsonian Institution. So here's one of the, here's one of their three mod 3D models of George Washington. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if it's a problem with 3D Hop as a platform or if it's a problem with with the model, um, but this model of George Washington as a Roman statesman is a bit murky to say the least. But what 3D Hop does do that, that um, Sketchfab does not is to offer some, some measurement tools. So for example, if we find here the measure tool, click on that, switch it on, and you can measure between points. So between those two points is 14.56 centimeters. There's also a slice tool so you can cut George in half if you would like to, if you have a reason to do that. Now, we would like to go beyond this. Um, the, the measuring tool that's available in 3D Hop is only a straight line point to point measure. 
What we'd like to do is to have a digital tape measure that would measure across a curved surface. Another feature that would be really important to have would be a viewer that allows more than one object to be loaded, scaled identically, and then manipulated independently for purposes of comparison, but also for joining fragments, um, which this would be especially useful when pieces of objects are scattered across different collections. Uh, we'd like to have an integrated RTI viewer in our platform, and that's actually an easy one. There's an open source RTI viewer that can be embedded in web pages. And uh, an augmented reality presentation for hieroglyphic inscriptions of our objects um, and for restorations, if and when we produce them, would be very useful. So to conclude, um, digital tools offer a very large range of, of ways to approach the study of Egypt and any other culture from any time period. Um, but I think they're best use, used in conjunction with the well-established methods of scholarly inquiry. I do want to stress that this is an important direction for students to go in. If you're a student of Egyptology or a prospective student, or if you advise students, I think you, would, you should be aware of this. Look to see where you or your students might find a place in this field. Um, Egyptological virtual heritage is growing. It's only going to get more important it offers the possibility for obtaining results and for presenting those results in completely new ways. So I thank you for your attendance and uh, I look forward to any questions or comments. I thank you. It was absolutely brilliant. It was fascinating. And we don't unfortunately have much time for questions. Ah, I apologize uh, for that. No, you were so informative. I am absolutely delighted with the way this has been. Um, I just want to make a couple of brief question statements, rather, if I may. You mentioned Katya from the Brooklyn Museum. She spoke about animal mummies at the club. I mentioned Donald Sanders. Please, everyone, look at chat. He was wonderful about this virtual reality. It's online. Katya's program was a live program. And we had also, an event on Hadrian's Villa, which you mentioned, with Francisco de Angelo. So I'd like everyone to see that. I re-listen to programs. So if the audience wants to re-listen to you on the recreation of these wonderful Egyptian objects, by all means do. Someone asked about the British Museum and the Louvre, if they have such programs. I want you to know that Donald Sanders has worked with the Louvre, but at the British Museum, he worked with the seriologist uh, Julian Reed, who's the husband of Julie Renee Anderson, who spoke online for the club. Uh, the talk was wonderful. People are fascinated. How do they learn more uh, what this means for people using their computers, how they can access, what I'd like to do with you if you don't mind. And I'm sorry to our audience, but it was such a great talk. And the club has allowed you because this has been absolutely splendid beyond our given hour. You and I will get together and we will send replies, mainly you and I will access them to everyone who has written with a question. But what I'd like you to do is quickly put in the chat your email address, because I may not have it and Steve may not have it. But we want to follow up on this stellar presentation. I thank you. I mentioned our next program, October 20. Six, I look forward to seeing some of you. It will be live at the National Arts Club. This is one of the advantages of Zoom that you can address an international global audience and educate us all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.